welcome to Working With What You Got. I'm a Joshua Porter, and I am so glad that you decided to join Well, you know, our program is all about you realizing you have more time, you have more talent, you have more resources, you have more faith, you have more energy, more money, more than you think you have, and it's time to unknot your mind. Well, do what we always do. Start off by so now you're saying, what am I going to make? All I have is leftovers. I have leftover rice from a Chinese takeout, ground meat from when I had Italian night. I had leftover beans from Mexican night. I just have leftover stuff. So now you're thinking, what should I do? What? You're going to work with what you got, and you're going to make yourself a dirty rice. That's right. Well, we're going to start off putting a little oil in the Then we're going to put in some of our rice. Mm, I love the sound of hearing it sizzle. Put in some more rice. I've been getting different comments and concerns saying, Renee, we need more measurement. We need more measurement. Okay, I'll try to be more precise. But you have to know, part of working with what you got is no fear. No fear if you have too much. No fear if you have too little. So let's just say I've given you an uh, exact measurement. A box of rice, okay? A box of Chinese rice. Is that good enough? It's probably equivalent to about a cup. I'm just being facetious. Okay, so you have your rice in here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put in our ground turkey. And this is actually a cup and a half. I'm going to use half the amount. We have our ground turkey. We have half a cup of red onions. We're going to put in a spoonful of our beans. And this is to your liking. I love beans, but beans may not like you. So, you know, go easy on the beans. All right? Then what I decided to do, because bacon makes everything taste great, we baked a couple slices of bacon, and we're putting in a cup of turkey bacon. So we have our rice, we have our onions, we have our ground turkey, we have our turkey bacon. Now remember, every week you're going to hear me say it, you have to eat the rainbow. If your food is too beige, too brown, that means that you're missing some vital nutrients. So we have some peppers. We're putting in a lot. This is a cup of red and yellow peppers. Keep stirring. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? Are they seeing this, Tom? Tommy? That's looking excellent. And now we're going to put in a little green. Put in a little parsley. Just a two pinches of parsley. Now we have our seasoning. We use a little onion powder, a little garlic powder. We like garlic. A little chili powder. Not too much. The chili powder that I get is not hot. It has a beautiful aroma. Just keep stirring. You may want to put just a little water in there. I think I have a little water here. I think I put a little bit of salt. I use sea salt. The last ingredient that we put is cumin. Now I have some views on cumin. I think cumin is a wonderful spice, but it's very loud. It's kind of like that friend that you have that you like when they come over, but sometimes they're, they're kind of intrusive. That's how cumin is. Cumin can sometimes take over. So you have to really just go gingerly with the, with the cumin. I do two pinches and then taste. What did we put in? We used a box of our leftover Chinese rice. We used parsley. 
ground turkey, turkey bacon, pinto beans, salt, chili powder, garlic powder, and onion powder, and our precious friend, cumin. All right, let's see. I'm going to do a little taste, and then we have a guest sampler today. What? Mmm. Oh, my gosh, this is delicious. And it's pretty. Okay. You ready to sample it? We have our sampler, Janine. Okay. Janine is going to be our sampler today. Isn't it nice and pretty? See all, see all those colors in there? Beautiful. Where's our fork? Oh, right here. All right, try it. Wonderful. <laughs> and I didn't even pay her to say that she liked it. It's good, right? Yes, finish it, of course. And you can have some more. Delicious. You see how simple it was? All you have to do is realize that you have more than you think you have. We took all these little leftovers and came up with a delicious dirty rice. You can do it. You can work with what you got. And we have a great show in store for you today. We have Dr. Jean Bacon. We have Peggy Hannon. We have a guest rancher today. It's going to be so great. And we'll be right back after the commercial. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Stephanie Thomas, and I'm filling in for Milani today, and I have a rant. Is it possible to have that relationship you've always dreamed of? And is it worth it to sacrifice your morals for a potential relationship or a potential love in the society we live in today? And how long will it take to meet the one? Those are just some of the questions so many beautiful, gifted, talented women are asking themselves. Why are we so discouraged and afraid that it's never going to happen? We whine, we complain, and we throw pity parties of negative words talking about how wonderful we are and how bad men are. This is limiting us. What about speaking life into your dreams and believing that they will come to pass? What about encouraging each other and speaking positive? Instead, misery loves company. And this is where it gets exciting. We talk about our standards and how we have high expectations of how we want to be treated, especially in a relationship. But what about talking about how, what we are willing to offer and give in a relationship? For example, you want a man who is honest and who's going to be true to his word. When so many of us are becoming faker and faker by the minute, we strunt our stuff with fake nails, fake hair, fake personalities, fake body parts, and we're trying to become something that we're not. Why can't we just be comfortable in our own skin? Here's another good one. We want a man who's hot, sexy, physically fit, but yet we eat unhealthy, fast foods. We don't make going to the gym and exercising a priority, and we don't take care of ourselves, but we want a fit man. Does that make sense? No. I think it's time for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and really realize the beauty that we have within and not be afraid to let that shine forth. I think it's time to use what we got and be willing to be what the person that we would like to see in our lives. And that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was some really, really great points. Well, we're back. And I have two wonderful women that are joining me tonight. I have Miss Peggy Hannon, who's a wonderful, wonderful example of triumph in the midst of very adverse situations. And I have Dr. Jean Bacon from Butterfly Counseling Services. And Jean is going to be able to offer us some real practical tools on what you can do when you're handling crisis for a long, extended period of time. Now I want to start over here with Miss Peggy. If you could start by telling our audiences how many children you have and just give us a little background information. 
I, I have six children. I have 12 grandchildren and an, another one on the way. Thir so it'll be 13, gr 13, yeah, 13 grand grandchildren. Okay, yes. excellent. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons I had asked you to come is because I know from talking and knowing you over the years, you are a woman of tremendous faith. And some of the things that you've encountered and you've endured is more than the average person. But above it all, you've managed to still keep your joy, still keep your perspective. Kind of share with our audiences some of the trials that you've endured. Well, um, I, I have six children, and my uh, uh, third child, uh, Brian, he had developed um, a kidney problem when he, when he was born, and that was our first bout with sickness okay and that was very difficult and then uh, uh, then two of my other children were diagnosed with cystic fibrosis and they uh, they died one died at 13 and one died at 15 years old so uh, it, it, it was very trying and I lost my health during all this time too so it was really difficult to, when I had my uh, Sixth child, I suffered fractures in my back from from loss of calcium. So I was in a brace, you know, from my neck down to my uh, knees, and uh, so that that was also very difficult not to have my health. Besides, so let me recap. Yes, because just yes. so we can yes. just understand, you're saying you had six children. Yes, in that time with the six children. You, your health depleted because the calcium had depleted from your body. Yeah. So you had fractures in your back, a brace from your neck down to your knees, yeah. raising these six children. Two out of the six children had cystic fibrosis, and then another one had gotten meningitis, you had said? Well, he, yes, yes. He, that, uh, yes, my, when, uh, my, uh, he was the first part of the sickness that had happened. So was all it? of this was taking place. Like you kind of Give me a span of time. We're talking a year. We're talking two years. We're talking. Uh, well, he uh, Brian was was only a, a baby when it happened. He was uh, so, and then uh, then as the uh, my other child Nancy was before him. She had cystic fibrosis, but I didn't know it. She was just a sickly child. Mm -hmm. So we and would say the span of these things that were taking place, because you said that one you lost one child at thirteen another one at 15. So this is from, this is an extensive amount of time. It's an, it was very extensive, yes. So is it safe to say maybe over five years, over six years, over seven uh, years? Uh, I, I, I would say uh, about 10 years. It was about 10 years when, the, when uh, all of this was taking when place. All this was taking place, yes. Wow. Yeah. Now, how did you handle it? Well, I didn't handle it very good in the beginning. I, I really, I was... Uh, but I was very depressed. It was very hard for me. Mm -hmm. But I always loved God, and I would always go to church. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, time I, uh, one time I was in church, and I asked God, I noticed other people had peace that I never had peace. And uh, I said, but I wouldn't go out looking for this peace, but, uh, but if he would show me, the, you know, show me the way, because I, I knew, I trusted God, but I, I was a mess. And uh, a neighbor of mine took me to uh, a church. when I knew it was God because she asked me to go to this healing service. And I was very excited to go. And when I went there, uh, I, I was nervous because it wasn't in my church. It was in, in a non-denominational church. And the Lord touched my life in a mighty way that night. He gave me a peace. He healed my broken heart about my two children that had this fatal illness. And... With that, I was really, even though so many things were happening to me, I still, I always, I had a, I had a faith in God, a trust in God. And I tell you, and everything else that happened in my life, if it wasn't for that, I would never be able to have endured. So let all. me ask you, when you found this peace, the situations didn't stop? No. No, no, and things got worse. <laughs> so that's, no. a, that's an important part. Yes. It wasn't all of a sudden you found this peace and then you woke up and there was, you know, rainbows and sunshine no. everywhere. You know, you found this peace, but the situation was still there. Oh, yes. Oh, definitely. Oh, but definitely. what was different was you. It was me. And, and God is faithful. That's all I can say. And even after my 
two children went home to be with the Lord. One was, as I said, one was 13, one was 15. And then I had my son who was uh, in high school and he was a great baseball player and we really thought he was going to go on to, you know, get, get a good scholarship at college mm -hmm. and things like that. And in his, in, in his senior year in high school, his whole hip decayed. And that was from some kind of a virus that he, he had as a baby. Wow. And uh, so, and, but uh, they had said he, would have, he had arthritis through his whole body. But thank God it, they found out it was, it was a virus and it was his hip. It, later on in life, he was able to get a, a new hip when he was 36. So. And then after that, my, my daughter Mary, when she was 13, came down with uh, diabetes. <laughs> Very bad. You, yeah. you can make this up. You really couldn't make this up. No. You couldn't make this up. <laughs> I couldn't make this up. Wow. Well, but, let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. Yeah. What would you say would be one of the biggest things that you would tell someone about how do you work with what you got? That's a lot that you were handed. That was a lot. Mm. So how do you work with that? You know, how do you work? If somebody says, you know what, every time I'm trying to come up for air, something else is hitting me. You know, another crisis is hitting me. Not only is it hitting me, it's hitting my children. I mean, I can only imagine the toll it may have taken just on the whole family That's dynamic. Right. That's mm -hmm. intense. What do you tell somebody? How do you work with that? And then it's not, it's not ending. So mm -hmm. you're saying this is a, a span of 10 years, and then you come for a reprieve, and <gasps> something else hits you again. Mm -hmm. So what do you tell someone? Well, uh, I have to give all the credit to God. He's very faithful. He took me through it all and when, you know, even as at all, all different things happen to everybody in life. And if, you do, and if you don't have any faith in God, I don't know how you'd make it. God is faithful. That's as I sit here and say, God is very, very faithful. You said something when we talked, and I want you to yeah. share it with oh. the audience. You said, who did you say to ask? You said, ask. Oh, what I did was I asked God, my, I asked God, uh, uh, you know, when, when I would say to anybody, uh, if anybody asks a question of how do you do this, or how, you have to ask God your questions. Mm -hmm. And if, you have, if you're honest with God and, you're, and you really you, you want peace and you, you're, the, you're the only one, like from a little child, I always loved God. Mm -hmm. So then I became, then when I, uh, when I asked God my questions and I came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. when I became born again, that changed my whole life. That was the only way that I ever could have made it through. So there wasn't any Jesus. points where you felt, because you said you always loved God. Now, you didn't feel like you had bad luck? You didn't feel like you were Oh, cursed. no, I never did. Mm -hmm. I never felt, and I never felt that I, uh, I, I always just knew. I, I had, God mm -hmm. gave me a peace. That, that's the end. God okay. gave me the peace. He gave you the peace. He gave me the peace. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. We'll be right back after this commercial. Hi, we're back with Peggy Hannon and with Dr. Jean Bacon from Butterfly Counseling Services. And Peggy was just sharing with us how she was able to endure with some very adverse situations. And now Dr. Bacon is going to be sharing with us some practical tools that you can implement when you find yourself with long-standing crisis. Dr. Bacon? Yes, I think that, Peggy, your experience of your faith is just phenomenal. Because when people suffer so many losses, oftentimes they struggle with their faith. They may get angry at God and feel like he's deserted them. They may not want to talk to family and friends because they feel like no one understands. So your testament is really, it's really exceptional. And thanks for sharing that with us. Not everyone is spiritual or religious in the way that you are, Peggy. For some people, they may leave their faith when these challenges come into their lives. And so if someone is faithful, certainly it is so wonderful for them to reconnect with their faith, reconnect with their church family. It's important that people identify the network and the activities that nurture and sustain them. Mm. 
So the things that may have brought them peace or solace or comfort before these challenges occurred, they need to rely on them at this time, especially at this time. So if family is supportive, if there's activities and events that individuals or families are engaged in in this time, it is wonderful if they can keep that going. Okay, so let me ask you something. You know as well as I do that there are some people that especially when they go through things, they isolate themselves. Yes. That's the time that they retreat from family. That's the yes. time they don't return phone calls. Yes. That's the time when they might really just separate themselves. Mm -hmm. Two questions. One, if you have someone like that that you're connected with, what do you do without mm -hmm. being intrusive? You know, mm -hmm. how do you reach out? You know, sometimes they shut you out yes. and you're afraid. You don't yes. want to push them over the edge. Yes. What do you suggest? I think that it is very difficult to intervene when someone is in so much emotional or physical pain that they withdraw. So it's important that individuals are very gentle in their strategy, that they don't intrude, that they do things like send notes, I was thinking of you, um, to remind them I'm here if you need something. Also to be very specific with what they're willing to do. So if you can cook a meal, say, I'm going to bring a meal over. What time would be useful? I can babysit the kids. Is there a time when they get out of school that it would be most helpful? But to be specific in what it is that they want to do to help. If it's financial, you know, you didn't ask for money, but, you know, I have this extra money and I thought you could use it. Here, don't worry about it. But to give with an open spirit, to be generous in their delivery of whatever it is that they want to do to soothe and to assist, Excellent. but to walk gently because you have to know that the person is very fragile at this time and they're isolating because they're very afraid that they might fall apart. Okay, so now you told us to be gentle. What happens when you're gentle? Mm -hmm. What happens when you're gentle, you're specific, and they bite? Okay. <laughs> right? Yes. Hurt because people, hurt that, people. That does happen. And you've got it. When people are wounded, sometimes they respond with that hurt, with that anger. And so those that want to, in a loving way, assist, they need to be persistent. Mm. And they need not to give up, even though the person may be shoving them out of the way. Even though it may feel like they don't want you in, in, your, in their lives, that they're angry at you like you did something to them. Remember, think of your history, the time you had together, and the ways that they probably intervened in your life when you shut the door. And so keep with a gentle hand. Be persistent. Drop notes. Leave phone messages. Don't take it personal if they don't call you back. Keep doing it. But always be gentle. Understand that they are in so much pain that it is very hard for them to reach back to you. But eventually, they will. It just has to be time. And I, I guess, don't be annoying in your persistence. Don't feel like, OK, I left them a message. They didn't call me back. I'm done with them. Or, you know, I helped them out. They didn't say thank No, you have to give really with a generous spirit and know that they're wounded. And so what do you do if, you, if you're trying to save a wounded animal? What do you do? You pick them up with the utmost of care. You're very soft and gentle in how you deliver your medicine. And so I think that's, that's the best way because oftentimes people are so hurt that it's very hard for them to respond in the way that we might like to see, polite and neat. <laughs> That's excellent. I just want to remind our audiences that our lines are open for phone calls. The number is right across the screen, so please join us in our conversation. Okay. I was thinking something else, though. Go ahead. I, I'm thinking that um, sometimes we don't know how to help. And so we want to do something, but we may not know what to do. It's okay to enlist other family members to ask, do you know if they need something? Do you know if there's something that they would like that would brighten their day? And so that you're doing in a way that is, they can receive it because it's something that they need. You know, it's something okay. useful to them. 
Okay, so we talked about how we can help. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell our audience, for that person that's there that's dealing with long-standing issues, mm -hmm. Peggy shared something that took place over a long span of time. Yeah. That's a lot of adversity that was like, do I come up for air? This feels like an avalanche, mm -hmm. you know, walking under this gloom. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that despondency that can really feel like yes. you're suffocating. Yes. What do you tell that person in the audience? What do you tell them? I can think of um, someone that I know that recently went through the passing of their father mm -hmm. um, unexpectedly, young mm -hmm. woman, then two years later losing her only sibling mm -hmm. in, a, in a tragic way through mm -hmm. a, a, a gun situation. Mm -hmm. She's feeling like, what more? What else? Yes. Is my life worth living? Yes. What do you say to them? What do you say to them? I would like to say keep going. Keep going anyway. And think also, what would that person that you lost want for you? What would they want you to do? Is there a way that you can honor them that will help other people? Is there a way that you can nurture yourself that will help yourself to go forward? Because we all have a purpose here. And although we lose many people that we care for and things that we value, we have to keep going. I think it's important that people know that it's okay for you to give yourself permission to laugh after the loss, to have pleasure after the loss, to get involved in something that brings you joy, even though you're feeling bad. We get into this mindset that because we're so suffering, because we're sad, we got to be sad 24 hours. We got to wear black and a veil <laughs> and be sad. We can't have joy in our lives. We have to show the world that we are suffering because somehow that's supposed to honor our lost loved one. It honors them to be joyful. It honors them if we can think of a way to give back that makes their passing valuable. That's an excellent point. I have another question. Okay. We honor them by moving on. What about the person that just can't get out of bed? Mm -hmm. Hajin? Okay. Sometimes they just can't, you know, I can't That's get right. out of bed. I'm, what's the sense of me getting up? What's the sense yes. of me even going to brush my teeth? What's the sense? Yes. Because that can happen. Yes. What do you say to them? It does happen. I mean, Peggy, I mean, were there moments yes. where you just... Oh, definitely. <laughs> Yes. yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Well, you can't even think about yes. how I'm going to honor somebody with, with my life if I, if I don't want it. Yes. If, it, if it's not yes. valuable to me, what do you do? That's when professional help needs to step in. If you see yourself wearing the same outfit all week, not bothering to eat, shave, comb your hair, change your clothes, if you can't put a thought on paper, if you just see yourself so engulfed in sadness that you can't take care of yourself, your children, your house, your loved ones, you can't go to work, then it's very important that you seek professional help. And if there's someone that in, in your life, someone is experiencing such emotional pain, you need to do what you can to help them get to professional help so they can get some relief. It's there for them. Every day I deal with people that have lost one, two, three loved ones, loss of their health. Nowadays, loss of employment, loss of their will to go forward. It doesn't always have to be a death that puts you in this position. Right. But that's when professional intervention is needed because you don't want the person to spiral so that they're thinking of harming themselves. Now, what, are you, what would you say are some of the most common situations that you encounter recently? Mm -hmm. I think um, loss is a, is a big one. Yes. Whether it's loss of life, of relationship, of good health, of housing, employment, there's a lot of loss at this time in, in our world, in, in our society. And so that's what sticks out most that people are experiencing loss and then they spiral downward. There's not an intervention to stop the fall. And so what happens, it starts with a loss, 
and then expands to other losses and they're in a position where they can't see their way out of the hole. I see that a lot, that one thing and another thing. And, you know, we, we are frail beings. Mm -hmm. And so when there's multiple challenges to our existence, we stumble, we fall. And so I think that's the primary issue that I see professionally coming through our doors. Mm -hmm. The loss. And the first yes. thing you tell them? is to give themselves permission to have joy. Yes, and that it's not going to feel this way forever. Okay. And so there has to be a commitment to health. There has to be a commitment to well-being. I know you feel really bad right now. We're going to work on that. I try to create a safe space where people can come and be honest and be real. And if they need to cry for 45 minutes, they could cry for 45 minutes. But it's all about the process of healing, getting to the place where you find your faith again, where you can find your joy again, where you can connect with all of the networks that sustain, nurture, and fill you up. I love what you said. I love, I love that. I love that idea of being able to connect. Mm -hmm. That is so, so important. And we'll be yeah. right back. We're going to continue with that right after this. And we're back. We're back with Dr. Jean Bacon from Butterfly Counseling Services and Miss Peggy Hannon. And we were just talking before the break about some of the things that we can do if we find ourselves wanting to be support for someone that may be going through a long-standing crisis. And also she was talking about if you are that person that's going through that long-standing crisis, mm -hmm. what are the, some of the things that you can do to kind of get yourself out of the mm -hmm. hole? But while we were on the break, um, Peggy here was sharing about depression. Please tell us. Oh, oh, I, I went through a lot of depression and... Uh, to me, it seemed like a long time, and when you are in a depression, it's like a, it's like a pit that mm -hmm. you can't get out of, and you don't function. And, mm -hmm. and uh, one day, one of my neighbors came knocking at my door, and I barely opened the door to, let, to talk to her for a few minutes. And she was, she was persistent. She was a little persist persistent. She kept talking to me, and she, found, I, and she got into my house. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. Mm. because I, was not, I wasn't functioning, so there was nothing done, you know. And, uh, but she just took off her coat and started cleaning up my house for me. Yeah. And, and she said, don't ever tell anybody about this, she said. And, it, it, and, you know, and I think sometimes mm -hmm. that's good when, you, when, you're not, when you're so depressed that somebody sometimes just has to force their way in. Yeah. And, I, and I thought it was good. So, and you remembered it. And I remembered it, too. But the thing I remember most about it is I did not want her to come into my house. I did not want her to see mm -hmm. the, what was really wrong with me, the, mm -hmm. you know, how bad things were. And, and, it, and, uh, and I think that's our, that's our isolation and our hiding yes. about how, what, what bad shape we're in. Peggy, I want to ask you a question. When she, when she came yes. and she cleaned up, did that lift your spirit? Did that make you feel better? You know, I think what made me feel better was that, some, uh, that she broke in and, she, and, and somebody found out what bad shape I was in. Wow. And, so, I, and I think and I, that was a good thing. So it was but relief. It was like a relief because I was hiding it. So the secret was out. The secret was out. So there really is a struggle sometimes, because remember, yeah. this is all about how knotted our yes. minds can be. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a struggle sometimes where you want to hide, but you want someone to know. Mm -hmm. Please, if someone can help me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one of the things, too, I remember at that time, uh, I used to uh, love nighttime when nobody else, nobody could knock at the door. It was, it was like the best time. You were safe. You, I was safe. Nobody was going to come near my yeah. door and knock at my door. Wow. Yeah, so I was, I was in a, a very bad depression at that time. I do thank God because, again, God brought me through. 
victoriously. But it does sound like a conflict. It says because you use the mm -hmm. word broken. Yeah. <laughs> and invasion. Yeah. She yeah. broke into the house. Yeah. But then relief that you didn't have to keep the secret by yourself. I think that is such a wonderful illustration of the conflict. Yeah, yeah, the conflicted feelings. Okay, so Dr. Bacon, tell us, what do you tell the person? There's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. What do you tell the children, the young people mm -hmm. that are dealing with a parent mm -hmm. that has long-standing issues? Mm -hmm. Because we forget about that. Mm -hmm. When we're going through things mm -hmm. for a long period of time, they may not be saying anything, but children yes. observe. Yes. And they learn. So what yes. do you tell that child who feels like my parents are in a hole, my family's in mm -hmm. a hole? When are we coming out of that? Yes. Well, first thing is I want adults to know the children know. It's not a secret. Many people believe they're hiding it from the kids. The kids don't know what's happening, whispering. Well, we can't talk to them about it because otherwise they'll know. The kids know. The kids are more informed than most of the adults. They have more than a clue. They will tell you when this happens, that happens, mama does this, daddy does that, and they put us in a room. <laughs> so they know what's going on. So the first thing is adults know the children are already aware. So you don't have to tippy toe around them. They will appreciate the honesty. So if you're a family member in a position where you can step in, you need to talk to the kids. You need to see if they need professional help. You need to see if they have a place that they can go to talk to about their worries, whether it's a school counselor, whether it's someone at church. Is there a place that they can go to talk about their worries about what's happening to their parent? Because the children are worried. But what is bad in their position is they can't change anything. They're kids. So they're not in a position to make change about what's worrying them. But if they have a place to put their worries, it will help them feel more in control and more at ease. Okay, so now with the parents, or maybe not even a parent, an adult, mm -hmm. how do they work with what they got? How does that adult handle the fact that they have this long-standing issues like what Peggy was mm -hmm. dealing with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's an adult that's not experiencing the trauma, but that's watching it. So it could be a family member? No, could be an adult that is experiencing that okay. trauma, that long-standing trauma. Okay. It's very difficult because the person in the trauma usually are in the trauma. Peggy described a pit. I call it a well, a hole. Okay. So they're in darkness. Oftentimes they're in a lot of darkness. And so they may not even be conscious of what the children are experiencing because they're in a dark place and they're seeing their sorrow, their wound, their pain. And so oftentimes it may not be the person that's experiencing the tragedy that helps their own children. It may fall on extended family members, neighbors, church family, physicians, teachers. Okay. That's when the village needs to come together in the sake of the family and the children. Okay, so that's when that outside help needs to come in yes. to be able to to pull it together yes. so the family can at least start to float. Yes. Even if they're not swimming, at yes. least they can start to float. Yes, because if the tragedy is long-standing, there may not be instant relief for yes. the individual that's experiencing it, but the children are in that muck with them. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Peggy. You jewel. Oh. I just love you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing with us. Oh, Thank yes. you, Jean, Dr. Jean Bacon. I love you. I've known you a <laughs> long time, and you get sweeter and sweeter. Mm. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back after this break. We're back. Hopefully you really enjoyed and you've been enlightened with the information that we got about how to handle long-standing adverse situations. Because remember, it's time to unknot your mind. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to take out those 
knots that keeps us thinking that this will never end and I'm the only one going through this and I have no one else on my side. Yeah. I want to leave you with a little story. I can remember when I was about 16 years old, I used to go to a dance school. And we use a term a couple of weeks ago called an island of competency. And I just want to say that dance was not my island of competency. But I went to the dance school anyway. So every time I would go to the dance school, I was always so afraid that I'd be singled out because I just was not that coordinated. When you start adding choreography, along with blinking, along with swallowing, it just kind of turned into <laughs> hieroglyphics in my mind and body. So we would have a guest teacher that would come to the dance school. And this time we had a guest teacher called Frank Hatchett. And everybody from the dance school was the Vinette's Cultural Workshop. About 300 students would be in the parish hall, and I would try to make sure I was all the way in the back because I didn't want anyone to see me as I tried to tap. They were teaching us tap. They're teaching us tap dance, and Frank Hatchett is showing it to us, and I'm all the way in the back. And then all of a sudden, the leader, the owner of the dance school, Mary Baird, God bless her soul, she says, stop the music, stop the music. She says, clear the floor, and all 300 kids clear the floor. And she says, Renee, Joshua, you come to the middle of the floor. Oh my God, please tell me that the floor is going to open up and swallow me. Please tell me that she's not calling me to the middle of the floor. She called me to the middle of the floor and she says, Renee, do the step. I said, step, shuffle, ball chain, ball chain, step, shuffle. She said, that's not the step. That's not the step. You're lazy. And you'll never be a good dancer if you don't pick up your feet. The, feet, the, the, the step is step, shuffle, ball chain, ball chain. Step, shuffle, ball chain, ball chain. Now do it. I stayed there and I looked at her. Do it. She said, do it or go home. I took my bag, I said bye, and I put my head up in the air, 16 years old, sassy, you can't tell me what to do. And I strutted out and I could hear everybody whispering, Renee left, Renee left, she didn't listen to Miss Beard. And I just took my dance bag, my brother was waiting in the car and I got in the car and I, as soon as I closed the car door, I can't believe it. she embarrassed me, oh my God. And I cried all the way from the dance school home. And I remember I got home, I said, Ma, I can't go back, I can't go back. She's so embarrassed and she humiliated me. Okay, Renee, you don't have to go back. Well, a year later, after I quit the dance school, I had entered into a contest where I was going to be um, doing drama. The contest was held now back at that dance school. So I had to come back to the dance school. But now I came back and I'm liberated. I'm not under that thumb anymore. And Miss Beard is standing outside of the dance school and she's smoking her cigarettes and she sees me walking up. I'm 17. I'm cocky now. It's my senior year. She said, why did you quit? I said, I quit because you deal with humiliation and I can't function with that. She blew her cigarette. Your problem is you don't know what's in you. I looked at her, whatever, and I walked off. As I walked off, later on, I had to compete in that contest in drama. I was the hundredth child competing with a hundred kids. As I was doing it, I thought to myself, she hates me, they'll never pick me. I made it in the regionals. I ended up making it over to the locals and the regionals. But when it came time for the nationals, I didn't make it to the nationals. Well, all of a sudden I heard that you didn't make it to the nationals, Renee, but there's someone that wants to sponsor you to the nationals. Guess what? Miss Beard sponsored me to the Nationals. <laughs> I went to the Nationals, and here I was in Missouri with kids from all over the United States sitting in this big auditorium, and I heard something. They said from the, from the pulpit, not the pulpit, from the auditorium, from the stage, would Renee Joshua come to the, um, the stage in the back? I kept my head straight. Miss Beard happened to be a chaperone at that time, too, and I didn't answer. They said, Renee, they called you. I'm not going. They called you to the stage. Finally, I went to the stage. They said, we heard you did a wonderful monologue. We want you to do it for the whole room. I did it for the whole room. And the first person that jumped up and gave me a standard ovation with tears streaming down their face was Miss Beard. And everybody else joined in and gave me a standing ovation. And I thought about it. My mind was so knotted that I never realized that all those years I thought I wasn't doing well in dance school, every year she was giving me an award that said most improved. When I quit, she was so busy seeing the greatness in me and wanting to push it. So I leave you with this. Who is it 
that you've invested in that may have rejected you like how I rejected her? Who is it? Or who is it that may not even see their greatness and all they see is what they can't do and their minds all knotted up? That day as I stood on that stage and I realized that I was supposed to be talking to people just like I'm talking to you right now. And she helped to push me in the right direction. And I'll always remember that. So free your mind and the rest will follow. Thank you for joining us and I'll see you next week. the one